musicians inspire each other. My passion for it is just the people I play with. They're such amazing musicians and such amazing people. It's true whether they are world-class instrumentalists or children from one of the poorest parts of the world. It's very inspiring to go to a place where the kids just want to play all hours of the night and they just they want they want to learn and they want to play music. It's very inspiring for them and also it's inspiring for us uh, musicians. When musicians find inspiration deep within them, it takes the form of inspired music. This film tells the story of the remarkable music and the remarkable personalities of a unique and intriguing group known as the Imbroglio Sextet. This was an old opera house. The Scottish Rite Theatre opened in 1871. The Texas heroes on the walls have seen an incredible variety of acts pass through its halls and occupy its stage. Of course, you should never leave a bunch of musicians unattended in a prop room. <laughs> Messrs. Travis and Crockett had never before seen an act like the Imbroglio Sextet. One of the songs at the beginning doesn't have trumpet and or a conductor. So Sydney and I were in the in the back and we found wigs. Of course I'm laughing, I'm trying not to let the, anybody hear me on stage. Sydney's like, I'm gonna go on stage with this wig on. Oh my gosh, it's the funniest thing. I just seeing the musician's faces as he walks out for that. Sometimes getting someone to smile doesn't require a word. The Imbroglio Sextet often takes that approach by necessity. Creo que lo más importante es, eh, aunque sea difícil hablar eh, en otro idioma, pues cuando necesitas explicarte o decir algo, buscas ¿no? la manera de, de hacerte entender. They all speak music, of course, and fluently, to judge by their instrumental acumen. The quality of these musicians is astounding because the fact that they can just hear it a few times, put it together, and then just land in front of these guys and start playing as tight as they do. It's even difficult to find the right words to name the ensemble's mix of instruments in any language. One can count six pieces, making it a sextet, but their particular combination doesn't match any traditional classical configurations. It's just an imbroglio. It's a very interesting group because you have a string quartet, a trumpet, and clarinet. As a violinist, you play a lot with string quartets or with piano trios, um, but it's different to play with wind instruments. Another unique collection of instruments inhabits Kara Pollard's house. Kara doesn't even play many of them. She's a trumpeter. And some have arrived broken in any case, though a brass and woodwind technician Kara knows will fix them. It doesn't matter because they will soon have a new home. The instruments will travel to Haiti, as the members of the Imbroglio Sextet do each summer. Two years ago in Haiti, we were all performing at a camp and, and teaching at a camp in Conge, and we met there. It's important because it me, me, me the opportunity to de, de give things that me have given before. Ecole de Musique Sainte Trinité sits in the middle of a Caribbean country that offers an abundance of natural beauty and of children who love music. Other resources come less readily. In the earthquake that happened a few years ago, a lot of the instruments were, were damaged or completely obliterated. And we've had students come to camp with basically duct tape around their instruments. They could use instruments and in music and the level of the hunger for learning and for music is higher than I'd ever experienced in the States. 
that's why we keep going back because these, these students just want so much. Haiti doesn't have a lot of the opportunities that we have here in the States um, and there's so much talent over there and the kids would they'd really benefit from, from um, getting free music lessons. To give the close to 500 Haitian students what they want and need, volunteers teach using the only language they and the kids have in common. La música es música, no es universal, no es igual en todos los sitios. En Haití, aquí, en España, en Alemania. The main language in Haiti is Haitian Creole. That was the hardest thing my first time at the camp to try to communicate to these students. I feel like I get so much out of, of um, going out there and, and giving back. I, it just they, they inspire me, um, and it's great making music with those kids. The inspired teachers use phrases of melody and harmony to create connections with their pupils and their peers. After 19 years of being away from Haiti, I was 11 when I left the country, I went back over the summer to um, teach at this music school. And so many wonderful musicians from all over the place go there to teach uh, music as well. When wonderful musicians gather, they must play together. In Kanj, teachers in formal jam sessions and organized performances help students form their understanding of music, and their mentors form impressions of each other. We perform twice a week. So we perform with uh, OPST, which is the or Orchestra Philharmonic de St. Trinity. It's a great orchestra that has members from Haiti, a lot of just the best players in Haiti, really great players. And then, of course, players from Spain and from all over the United States and Canada. So it's just, it's just this amazing opportunity to meet people who are like-minded and, and a little bit crazy. Están locos. The mindset that considers wig appropriation appropriate probably also helps one keep a positive outlook through less than ideal conditions and to help one's fellows do the same. Haiti was, was really, really difficult. You know, just because it's so hot, you don't know the language and all this. And it's because of those Spanish guys that I made it through my first time in Haiti. Because they always had me laughing. They always came, you know, came by and got me to smile. The musicians wanted to continue to play together, both musically and otherwise. If language presented no barrier to their rapport, why should the Atlantic Ocean? It was suggested that a tour could produce excellent music good times, and awareness of the plight of the young Haitians who aspired to follow in their instructor's footsteps. I met these musicians from Pamplona, and we all hit it off and hung out, and they invited me to come to Pamplona. I just met uh, these guys in IT, and, and we had uh, so good first uh, friendship, so, and then these two appeared, and they told me about that, and, and I really wanted to, to, to join them. The musicians began to line up performances in Spain and eventually England. Two problems presented themselves, even more daunting than transatlantic travel. They needed material, and they needed a name. To begin solving the first problem, and as it turned out eventually the second one as well, Kara turned to a colleague from Haiti. I talked with Sydney, who is the composer, and I said, hey, would you, would you be up for writing a piece for this group and possibly going and playing it in Spain. The composition proved a challenging one, partially because of the ensemble's non-traditional structure. We had to work uh, with the balance uh, um, because uh, the trumpet can be such a uh, bright and loud instrument. The Haitian-born composer, who now lives in Los Angeles, eventually figured out the necessary nuances. He wrote a three-movement piece that would become the group's signature work. But the sextet's conductor still needed something to call it. Sidney had written this piece and he couldn't figure out a really good name to call it. So he talked to his father. He's like, you know, I, I really need a good name for this and it's just, it's been so hard to write. So he wanted something to portray, or a name to portray, like the camp in Haiti, to portray, you know, writing this piece. But not only the hardships in Haiti, but the beauty of it. Like there's always a silver lining. Only, only something that was catchy, uh, something that would be universal. And I spoke to my dad about the different emotions that the piece takes you on, and he mentioned the word in Rubio, and I fell in love with it. And Rubio means a difficult situation, a complicated situation, and to me, in every difficult situation, there's always a silver lining. 
and it's the same word in French and Spanish, and so it's an international word also, and it was perfect. The group pronounces imbroglio with a hard G, as one would the similar word in French, which is widely spoken in Haiti alongside Haitian Creole. The name ended up working not only for the composition, but the ensemble as well. Even the entire tour, our Spanish tour, was like that. I mean, there were times where it's like, what, what are we doing? But it ended up being absolutely amazing. Whatever imbroglios may have arisen, the sextet flew through them to, in the end, have a successful tour. We were there for a month, Spain and Britain, performing this music, and we basically had sold out crowds the whole way. <laughs> The Imbroglio Sextet had now played in two of the three home nations of its members, plus the United Kingdom. For the next act, Kara set her sights on her own country. I said, hey, you guys should come to Texas. And they were very excited about that. Of the members of the Imbroglio Sextet, four live in Spain. Javier Navasquez, Salva Contreras, Alvaro San, and Lucia Nguyen. David Otto grew up there, though he now lives in Berlin. Only one lives in Texas which meant Kara Pollard would have a load of work to do on the who's, what's, when's, where's, why's, and how's of the second tour. They had lots of why's in place, including fellowship, bringing fresh music to new audiences, and promoting a common cause. We would actually like for these concerts to be kind of an awareness for what's going on in Haiti. They knew when they wanted to do it, April of 2015. The who's presented the first Imbroglio. Unfortunately, Alvaro, son, he couldn't make it. At Conj, um, I was a part of the Imbroglio performance, the very first performance. Um, and then just a couple months ago, Kara Facebook messaged me and asked me if I wanted to sub in to play with them here on tour. We got Katie Von Braun, who goes to the San Francisco Conservatory of Music and just phenomenal violinist. With the lineup set, everyone booked their plane tickets to DFW Airport. Where would they go from there? Kara wanted to start the tour in the town where she lives. In Fort Worth, I actually wanted to have a concert at TCU, but unfortunately with Easter, it was kind of hard. So, um, and then I checked with the Modern Art Museum and they were closed for renovations, so we couldn't do that. A local music venue would resolve the um, dilemma. So then I called Live Oak and they said, great, yeah, absolutely. Put your hands up there again. Just like that. Okay. Yeah, it was really weird. Okay. As she continued to work on the wares, Kara needed to work on some hows as well, including publicity. <laughs> Press releases generated coverage for the tour and the Indiegogo campaign that raised the money to fund it. I was really, really lucky to be able to be in a couple magazines. The 76107 had a great article. The radio station in Austin promoted us and all of the websites that for the venues they were really good at promoting us and well a lot of social media as photo shoots and the month of march finished tour time arrived an important part of the planning involved how to get the crew around texas highways the solution fragonita salva actually nicknamed it that and fragonita means gypsy van and it was completely full <laughs> The atmosphere in the van was a lot of fun. There were a couple sing-alongs in Spanish, which I just kind of hummed along. <laughs> I have no idea what she was singing. And it was very spontaneous because Lucia is very quiet, doesn't say much, and um, yeah. She just all of a sudden broke into song. Amado vida mía. <laughs> Madre mía. <laughs> Once the musicians got settled, songs demanded their attention, specifically rehearsing the ones they needed to play on the tour. The group had not played together in six months. They got in Wednesday. Of course, our first concert was Friday night. 
So we rehearsed pretty much nonstop for two days. They moved from the Pollard residence to a TCU theater for their Thursday evening rehearsal. In addition to finessing their existing repertoire, the combo needed to master some new pieces they had not played on the Spain tour and had to integrate a new violin pairing. Well, it's always really challenging to play chamber music with different people that you're not used to playing with. It might seem like a lot to do, musically speaking, in two days. It's not too bad because we're all professional musicians, and but um, and it will obviously come with the music ready. And when we, when we get together, it's all about the balance, making sure everything is okay, and making sure that we have all the entrances correctly. The rehearsals and the professionalism paid off. And I'm really excited. This is the premiere of the film. The Friday evening show at the Live Oak sounded tight before an appreciative crowd. <laughs> Before the show, however, Kara had thought about the uncertainty of opening the tour and whether her hard work would pay off. Katie noticed that I was kind of nervous. She came up to me and she's like, hashtag tour, hashtag fun. And I was, I was like, oh, oh my God. And so that, that totally got it. So the rest of the tour, we would say that before every concert. The next opportunity for pre-concert hashtagging would come the following evening at a Dallas museum. But before they left Cowtown, the Sextet and their significant others needed to see why the city had earned its nickname. It was a lot of fun taking all of them down to the stockyards and seeing the cattle drive, especially with them being from Pamplona. And they took us on the tour of the you know, running of the bulls. And so I was like, oh, this is Texas's version of running with the bulls. And yeah, it was like six longhorns going really, really slow down. <laughs> and so they got a really big kick out of that. The impression the state and its people made lasted throughout the tour. People very, very friendly. I like to be here joining the people, uh, talking with them. We ate so much Mexican food and so much barbecue, but they loved it. They thought it was amazing. I love Texas. <laughs> The decor at the next stop on the Texas tour might have reminded the ensemble's Spanish contingent of its home. Dallas's Meadows Museum specializes in Spanish art. The setting would offer a sense of familiarity for another member of the group too, as the Pollard clan turned out en masse. I've always gotten a lot of really great support from my family for everything. Every concert I've ever done, they've always been there. The family and the rest of the crowd witnessed a superb performance in an intimate venue, despite one false start that drew smiles from the tight-knit, yet loosely wound, group of musicians. I got it. Thank you. Afterwards, Kara's family adopted the out-of-towners. Their hospitality extended to the next morning's holiday. My little sister loves to have parties, and, and uh, with Easter, she had wanted to have lunch for the family, and she knew that we were going to be driving to New Orleans that day. So she said, well, you guys should just stop, stop by, and I'll make a big brunch. And it was really nice to be able to pay back the Spanish guys, because when we were in Spain, Oh my gosh, uh, Javier and Salva both, they laid out the spread that, oh my gosh, so much food. In the next stop in the tour, New Orleans, a city known for great music, the group had another holiday to celebrate. We went down to Frenchman Street and there was just chalk lying around and people had drawn a whole bunch of stuff on the, th on the, on the ground. And so I bent down and I'm like, happy birthday to me. <laughs> And so then David was like, oh, this is cool. So that's when he, he drew the name and he put in Broglio and, you know, did, did all of that. And then everybody spontaneously sang happy birthday to me. It was actually kind of cool. <laughs> On Kara's birthday, she had booked a show at the Trinity Episcopal Church in New Orleans. We went in and saw the woman who had, who had booked us. 
And unfortunately, she had had brain surgery a couple weeks before. She had totally forgotten that she booked us. So, and she had booked a Tibetan monk. The monk performed his combination of speech and song for some 45 minutes. Once he stopped, we decided we're just going to do imbroglio and be done with it. So we do, we do two movements, and then the harpist, who was also um, <clears throat> booked for that night, decided to go ahead and go, although we had one more <laughs> movement. So she played a little something, and then we played our last thing, and that was basically, that was basically it for our church performance. It was a true imbroglio because you have this, this situation where you know, we're disappointed that we don't get to play our entire show. And you know, we had been really looking forward to it. We had promoted it that we were gonna play there, but you know, we, and we didn't. So it was this really uncomfortable situation. And then something really great came out of it. You know, Cause we, we did get to play a little bit and which was fun and we got some great stories out of it. But the best thing about that that happened was Katie's uh, idea to go perform in Jackson Square. Classical musicians busking on a New Orleans street corner. Why not? There were probably around, what, like 200 people there that just sat and watched us play. We played our entire, our entire, entire program. So it, it was a true imbroglio. Moving on to Houston, the group played a show at Ovation's nightclub in the evening, then enjoyed brunch at the home of Kara's uncle the next morning. The entourage then drove to San Antonio. Kara had not booked a concert in the Alamo City. She simply wanted to give the members time to eat, drink, and enjoy each other's company in one of Texas's showplace towns. The remarkable bond between group members had not frayed in the months since they had seen each other. Performing with all of these guys, there is absolutely no drama. And even Katie was saying that too. She's like, this is the first time she's ever been on tour where, you know, there's no drama. They're all wonderful individuals and wonderful musicians. You see them, it's like the brothers and sisters. They're joking. They have their inside jokes. They have the, the things they say that, that make them all smile and make this a little bit more fun when it comes to the, to the tour itself. It's like a whole family together yeah. and a lot of laughs. <laughs> The friendship, uh, it's the most important, and also the music. The music selection had been one of the big what's of the tour. The group needed pieces written or arranged for a trumpet, clarinet, and string quartet. As one might expect, the final program was an international mashup. The music's in the classical style, but there's a lot of Latin rhythms. <laughs> program included music from Spain, traditional Haitian pieces, and original compositions. I'm used to playing a lot of classical music, so this is, it has so many different influences. Haitian influence and um, tango music and music that's written for film, which is completely different. The film music, created by a Texas composer, didn't just sound different. It looked unique, too. I commissioned Brandon Brown to write the Imbroglio Sixtet, a piece entitled Four Movements for Film Projector, and it's a lot of old-time music. And it's a great piece, but I always felt that it needed another component. So we actually commissioned to, to have a video for this piece. Filmmakers Dave French and Rush Olson researched silent films available in the public domain and re-edited the pictures to accompany some new dialogue. Rush and Dave put the intertitles in, their own intertitles in, that kind of had a modern taste to it. There was some OMGs and some, some things like that. And of course, I personally couldn't watch them because if I watched it while I was trying to play, I'd, I'd crack up every time. So they were very funny and they went perfectly with the music. So it was really great to have that video component. We edited the video to go along with the music that was previously recorded. The director had to know that the tempo had to be somewhat the same in order to land at the right spot with the movie. It's directly linked. The music is directly linked to the movie. So it's nice to, to have a different kind of connection with the music you're playing. The challenging part of it was to make the scratches and film damage really match that of what the original 
video, the original film, looked like. So we took um, a lot of different plugins and computerized uh, graphic software to allow it to look like the film. So it really matched. People look at it and go, well, wait a second, this looks like it's part of the original piece, but yet the words that are on the screen are obviously not made from 1910. I think it really added a lot to the piece, and the audience seemed to be really into it, too. The crew set up a projector at each stop to play back the video. After San Antonio, their next opportunity would come on the tour's final stop, in Katie's hometown. I was born in Texas, in Austin, so I spent the first six months of my life here. The group ate up their last bites of Texas. They visited the university where Kara earned her undergraduate degree, and the Texas Capitol sat less than a kilometer from their performance venue. The combo faced a mild imbroglio when they found the Scottish Rite Theater's doors locked, but once inside, they discovered a venue with loads of character. Next to the theater's collection of pole arms, Katie practiced for an upcoming performance back in California. In the vintage lobby, the merch table was set up for the final time. The musicians examined the 150-year-old stage, a brief rehearsal followed, and shortly thereafter, the last performance of the Texas-Louisiana tour commenced. Intermission found the band in classic offstage form. Sydney's hairpiece was not the only one stored in the dressing area. <laughs> During intermission, we all start getting all the props. We all try on the wigs, and we all try on other stuff that's in there. And it was, it was so much fun. That was, that was one of the best parts of the tour. Once again, the Imbroglio Sextet found ways to entertain each other without the need for words. After the intermission, they did the same for the audience. The last concert of the tour had ended. The imbroglios, or imbroglios if you prefer, had not. In Austin, I found little jars of mustaches. And those kind of went along with the wigs too, right? So there's a very serious picture of us in Scottish Rite, you know, all regal and, you know, with mustaches on. The brilliance of the imbroglio sextet lies in its members' ability to inspire and be inspired. Through performing splendid music for appreciative audiences, through teaching impoverished but eager children, and through sharing laughter and friendship with everyone they possibly can, no matter their who's, what's, when's, where's, why's, and how's. It's very inspiring for me to jump in to a group of people who are from different parts of the world. We are all from different places and we are coming together to make music. It's actually inspired me to do more.
Oh, thank God. Okay.